it's a pleasure and an honor to be back here. My subject this afternoon is my own colleagues in the university system. I'm looking at the changing ways in which academic experts in prehistory have interpreted Neolithic religion in Britain over the last couple of generations with some backdrop from there. And my starting point is uh, one with which absolutely everybody here will be familiar, indeed more familiar than most gatherings in the world, which is that the most important monuments of the British and Irish late Neolithic are all aligned accurately on the solstice sunrises or sunsets, by which I simply mean the most famous in each of the three great nations. In Ireland, of course, Newgrange famously is aligned upon the winter solstice sunrise. Mays Howe in Orkney as famously upon the winter solstice sunset. And increasingly, it's coming to be known and appreciated that the big deal at Stonehenge was the winter solstice. The avenue is certainly aligned upon the midsummer sunrise, but as we've heard here already today, it's also by definition facing the sunset as you come up it to Stonehenge. And as probably everybody here knows by now, some may not, the greatest single part of the monument, the Great Trilithon, the biggest of those three stone freestanding settings that make a horseshoe in the center of the stone circles, was aligned upon the midwinter sunset so accurately that when the sun went down in the week or so around the solstice, it would send a beam of red light straight through the narrow gap between the uprights of the trilithon, and it would hit the altar stone right in the center of the monument. Now, what this meant, I don't pre pretend to know, and nor do most of my colleagues. That's the lovely thing about it. If I were my honored friend, Terence Meaden, who's here today and will be speaking in my slot tomorrow more gloriously, then probably I could see it as a phallic ray from a phallic sun coming through the great trilithon to touch and fertilize the female earth. That would work beautifully. Or alternatively, in another of Terence's moods, I could look at that great trilithon and I could see the red blood of the sun pouring between it like the menstrual or birth blood between the legs of a gigantic goddess. That's another utterly legitimate way of looking at it. I'm choosing Terence-like examples to honor and acknowledge him, but they're two very good ways of looking at this fantastic construction. Except, of course, the fantastic construction isn't there anymore. And this makes one of the points about Stonehenge you don't often hear in any context, which is that it was built by cowboys. The design was absolutely brilliant. The execution of it was slipshod. What happened with the great trilithon is they couldn't find two uprights of the right length or else they weren't bothered enough to find them. So they got half of it right. They got a gigantic stone that could go five or six feet into the earth to keep it rock solid and upright. It's still there but they didn't get another to match it, and they skimped. Instead, they got a much shorter upright, but with a projecting bit of stone from the bottom, rather like a shoe. And you can almost hear the arguments four and a half thousand years ago around the drawing board. They convinced themselves that if they stuck this upright just next to the rock-solid stone, then the projecting bit beneath the turf would anchor it. And if they stuck a heavy enough lintel on top, secured by mortise and tenon joints to the dependable stone by its side, the deeply embedded stone would keep the other one upright forever. And they were wrong. <laughs> At some point after the trilithon was built, the shorter stone skidded out fell over inwards into the centre of Stonehenge, broke in half, knocked over the altar stone sideways, and left 
two enormous broken bits of megalith in the centre of Stonehenge over a toppled altar stone where they've been ever since. The broken bits were never fished out, the thing wasn't repaired. It seems to have been the end of Stonehenge as its original functioning monument. So Stonehenge, from this point of view, was a disaster. And in fact, it may be it was never finished. There's no solid evidence as yet that there were ever any stones in the outer part of the circle on the southwestern side, the side towards the sunset. Maybe they never intended to build them so they could get a better view of the sunset. A few summers ago, we detected holes in the right place. And just for a moment, we had a fantastic thought that we might have proved that there were stones there. But it only took a few minutes for Killjoys to say, as they should, that there are no evidence that stones were put in these pits if they were intended to receive the outer circle. And they may not be Neolithic at all, as we haven't yet excavated them. They could be pits dug in later millennia by treasure hunters. The one thing we can say is the Great Trilithon was the greatest engineering work of the late Neolithic in Britain, and it didn't work. It failed. But that's a digression in a sense, just meant to bring home how important the sun was to these three great monuments. Admittedly, most of the megalithic monuments of the early and late Neolithic are not firmly and indisputably aligned on the sun. They may well be aligned on the moon instead. They may well be aligned on stars. Uh, this doesn't worry me because it fits with the usual pattern in Neolithic monuments of intense local diversity and creativity. Repeatedly, a similar basic language of ceremonial architecture found across the whole of the British Isles and often across Western Europe, was interpreted at local level in a very wide range of different forms. And I'm going to turn now to emphasizing that I'm not concerned with the relationship between prehistoric monuments and astronomy because I'm not an astronomer. So I'm not concerned with how prehistoric monuments should be interpreted Instead, I'm interested in how they've been interpreted. And that is a concern which fits well into those of this conference. So I'm going to look, as I said, at what academic experts have written about the cosmological aspects of Neolithic sites in Britain. In other words, the implications they've drawn from their form, including their orientation on the sky. And the important thing here is that these conclusions have altered significantly during my own lifetime. And the alterations concerned can, in my opinion, provide some very interesting insights into changes in modern British culture. Before I dive in properly to this, it's also worth emphasizing as a backdrop to these changing views that these three great monuments I've saluted, Newgrange, Maze Howe, and Stonehenge, are all concentrated in the late British and Irish Neolithic. That's from about 3200 to 2500 BC or BCE. Before and after that period, those interested in archaeoastronomy have found much less evidence of interest in the sun in ceremonial monuments. Furthermore, the appearance of apparent intense interest in the sun is part of a much bigger change in British and Irish prehistory. It's no less than a revolution in attitudes to sacred space in the minds of prehistoric people. Put simply, the classic monument of the early Neolithic the fourth millennium BCE, that's about 4,000 to 3,000, is what I call the tomb shrine. Local British names for it include Long Barrow, Long Cairn, Dolmen, Passage Grave and Cromlech. 
You do get lots of other types of monuments in the early British Neolithic, but the tomb shrines found all the way around Western Europe, from Spain to Sweden. And it consists of a big stone or wooden chamber, usually containing human remains, and often contained in a mound or earth of stones, much larger than was necessary merely to cover the chamber. And these structures are intended to make impressive statements in the landscape. They're the first widely distributed form of monument to be adopted, by, to be adopted within the entire human race, the very first widespread tradition of, Neolithic, of, of human architecture on the planet. Most of them have no clear alignments on the movements of heavenly bodies. They're speculative. But the interesting thing is the mounds and chambers are of many different shapes, but forms of rectangle or trapezoid are the most common for both, rather than the circle. But in the years around 3000, the peoples of the British Isles become fascinated by round shapes for the first time. The standard sacred unit of space becomes the circle for at least one and a half thousand years. And when you take round houses into consideration as built in the Bronze and Iron Ages, the circle remains important for another one and a half millennia. At the same time, as the circle becomes the great unit of space, monuments began sometimes to be orientated with great precision on the movements of the sun, especially at the solstices, as I've just acknowledged. But the changes took two different forms in different halves of the British Isles. In Ireland, West Wales and Northern Scotland, it was grafted onto the older tradition of the tomb shrine. And the result of this tradition was to take it to its greatest achievements in structures like Newgrange and Mays Howe, huge round mounds, bigger than anything before, containing long passages leading to chambers with those alignments on the midwinter sun and in Wales on the midsummer sun. But in most of Britain, the tomb shrines were abandoned quite dramatically at this time, no more being built and those still in use being blocked up. Instead, people took to holding ceremonies in open air circular enclosures, the materials of which depended on what the local geology provided. In areas of soft soil, they're made into earthen banks, piled up around ditches, and of course, we call these structures henge monuments. In regions with plentiful timber, rings of wooden posts were erected, and where large stones were abundant, they were put up on end to form circles of megaliths. Some circles are the classic surviving monuments of the third millennium BC in Britain, after the earthen henges have been ploughed down and the timber rings rotted away, the stone circles have survived to define the monuments of this time for the modern age. And many of the greatest of the new ceremonial landscapes, like those around Avebury and Stonehenge, combined all of these forms, stone circles inside banks and ditches, often succeeding wooden structures or having those nearby. And as said, some of these incorporated the new alignments on the sun. And dramatically, the dead are no longer put into the tomb shrines, whether their remains were, where their remains had been a major part of religious rites. It's clear that human bones are often taken out of the tomb shrines and then put back. And we know this because they were often put back with the wrong bodies of people groping in the dark. So they must have been taken out for ritual use in a religion transmitted at least partly through the dead. But once the circles come to dominate, the dead are sealed off under smaller circular mounds, those we call round barrows in England. And increasingly, the dead are cremated before burial. There, their bodies are cut off from the world of the living, but often accompanied now for the first time by valuable goods, 
These may have been for use in the next world. They may have been presents to honour the dead. Or they may have been possessions of the deceased, too strongly associated with them for others to feel safe using them. Or they might have been bribed to deities to look after the dead wherever they were going. All those are different options, and maybe you can think of more. It's up to you. So all this is undoubted archaeological fact. There isn't a great deal of that, so it's nice to have it. What this represents is a revolutionary change in the nature of the religious monuments of the British Isles that took place in the years round about 3000 BCE, BC, about 5,000 years ago. And this calls out for explanation. It's a more dramatic change in the form of religion than the Protestant Reformation was, say, to Christianity about half a millennium to go, ago in historic times. So what are the explanations? They've indeed been provided, and they are, as I've suggested, revealing of changes in modern British culture. The one that was dominant during my adolescence in the 50s and 60s and which was throughout, dominant throughout the mid-20th century, had many virtues. One of these was simply unanimity. It was accepted by all the leading experts in British prehistory, in alliance with colleagues who specialised in all other parts of Europe. Another virtue was its longevity and its consistency. It had been developing steadily for one and a half centuries, before reaching its height of dominance in the 50s and 60s. And it portrayed the tomb shrines as having been the temples of a religion dedicated to a single great goddess who represented the earth and the generative powers of Mother Nature. It held that this veneration of the great goddess had first arisen in the Near East and been brought to Western Europe by megalithic missionaries until it covered the entire continent and the whole Mediterranean basin. And the tomb shrines were held to represent the goddess's body, in which the dead were laid to await rebirth, and in which they acted as mediators between the human and divine worlds. In this traditional view, the goddess's worship was brought to an end by invaders from the steppe country, which bordered Eastern Europe. These introduced a new religion, focused on the sky and above all on the sun, and on the element of fire, which was associated with the sun. It was they who established the new circular temples, mirroring the solar orb, the new round burial mounds, and the rite of cremation, by which the dead were committed to the sacred fire. And according to this traditional view, the newcomers also brought a fire-based technology consisting of metalworking in gold, copper, and bronze, replacing the stone tools and weapons of the tomb shrines. This gave them a military superiority which enabled them to conquer and absorb the tomb shrine builders. And moreover, according to this traditional view, the invaders were a different race to those whom they subdued, being taller, blonder, and with blue eyes, whereas the Stone Age folk of the tomb shrines were small and dark. The invaders therefore had the edge in physical as well as technological prowess, which didn't stop them from being total bastards. <laughs> the sense of who the total bastards were did change in the course of the 20th century. The view that I have described, the traditional picture, had developed well before the end of the 19th century. In the late Victorian period, the sun-worshipping, metal-using invaders were regarded as the Celts, but over the next generation, the Celts were moved forward in time to the Iron Age as the last great wave of prehistoric newcomers to Britain. Instead, the bringers of the solar religion of circles and fire 
became the Indo-Europeans, given the specific form in Western Europe of the Beaker people. These were named after the distinctive drinking vessels found in graves beneath the early round barrows. The beakers were one component of a complete assemblage of newly appeared weapons, tools and ornaments, which archaeologists interpreted as the trappings of a warrior society. Now, this model of change was deeply satisfying to a range of personality types and interest groups in modern British and European society, which is why the picture I've presented to you was the absolute orthodoxy when I was a youngster and a schoolboy. It wasn't a hypothesis, it's what we read in the textbooks and were taught as fact. And you can see why it was so successful. It provided a dramatic and lucid story that appeared to fit the archaeological evidence. For another fact, it could be retold with a number of different infusions of sympathy. For those emerging into a post-Christian society and experiencing a need to engage imaginatively with the divine feminine, the concept of a primordial great goddess preceding gods was deeply attractive. It could be given a deeper feminist hue by suggesting that the small dark people of the Neolithic who worshipped her also had a woman-centred society, more pacific and ecologically friendly than those after it. And this had the effect of making the arrival of the Beaker people all the more tragic, as it could be made to represent not only the replacement of a matriarchal society with a patriarchal religion, but an equivalent change in society in which men came to dominate over and maltreat women. In this view, it took the form of the destruction of a peaceful, consensual, responsible and feminist order by violent patriarchal brutes who introduced a system based on inequality and exploitation, which glorified war and masculinity and had a polluting and extractive technology. The converse interpretation, which is just as attractive to a different mindset, is to say, yeah, okay, the invaders were bastards, but they are a bunch of bastards. And so to glorify the coming of the Beaker people and the solar religion as a great forward step in the progress of humanity. This view characterized the Neolithic with or without a woman-centered society as having been more ignorant and savage than the succeeding Bronze Age. It glorified or at least respected the Beaker people as being a more sophisticated society as well as a much superior technology. Their arrival in this vision was one of the first great steps taken by European humanity in its long march towards the benefits of modernity. It's not difficult to see that between them, these two different approaches to the same basic story summed up between them the two opposed attitudes of modern Westerners to the modern age and modern society. Both of the basic components of the story, the great goddess and the beaker people, had deep roots, and they converge from separate points of origin. The concept of a universal goddess, identified with the natural world, drew upon ancient ideas, but had become dominant in the Western literary imagination with the coming of the Romantic movement and the realization of the harm that cities and industrialization were starting to do to the planet. As such, the idea of a redemptive mother nature, a mother nature goddess, was explored by poets and novelists all through the 19th century. And in 1849, it was back projected by a German classicist, Edward Gerhardt, into the ancient past. He, a professor at Berlin, became the first scholar to propose that such a great mother goddess had been worshipped by all the peoples of the prehistoric Mediterranean 
and Near Eastern worlds. In his reading, her figure had subsequently fragmented into the many goddesses and gods found in actual ancient pantheons when history began. The idea was gradually taken up by other German and French scholars in the rest of the century and adopted by their British colleagues in the early 20th century. Subsequent archaeological discoveries were promptly interpreted in harmony with it, creating a larger and larger structure of apparent evidence. As for the concept of invasions as the motor for prehistoric change, that's also a development of the mid-19th century, which spread from the continent to Britain. This time it was the Danes who proposed it in the 1840s. It's one of the rules of archaeology and its history that every time the Danes get trashed in the 19th century, our ideas of prehistory take a quantum leap because defeated Danish archaeologists look at their nation's prehistory and explore it thoroughly to try and supercharge Danish identity and nationalism, and in the process have some really good new ideas, which everybody else then imitates. Uh, for example, they invented the uh, idea of Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. Uh, earlier than that, off, off their previous trashing, they became the first nation to explore systematically their prehistoric monuments. So we owe an awful lot to them. But the adoption of their idea of invasions as the motor of prehistory was in harmony with a much greater uh, phenomenon than that of Danish difficulty. It was uh, an orthodoxy of British scholarship by the 1860s and fully elaborated by the 1880s. And the reason for its instant appeal is very clear. What it outlined was a story of British prehistory in which technological and social change was introduced by successive waves of aggressive newcomers, each more technologically advanced than the last one. And what clearly underlies this picture is the reality of European imperialism in the same period, during which European or Europe-derived states like America and Canada were spreading their rule across ever larger areas of America, Africa, Asia, and Australia. English-speaking nations in particular were sending large bodies of settlers into these, dispossessing and sometimes destroying the native peoples who had occupied them. And this experience explicitly lay the developing Victorian view of British prehistory. And an explicitly racist element was injected into this view by the belief that each successive wave of invading incomers had been taller, blonder, more blue-eyed and stronger than the last. The greatest single replacement, however, had still been that of the small dark people of the Neolithic with their preoccupation with earth by the taller, fairer, more like us people of the, that's unless you happen to be small and dark, in which case tough, uh, with their sights on the sky. The argument that remnants of the older inferior race were still found among the modern population of the islands enabled the Victorian British elite to present pseudo-scientific reasons for despising particular subsets of the British and Irish population. The Irish en masse were the principal victims of this view, but sections of the British working class were also fair game. The scholar responsible for the idea of this genetic replacement was a medical doctor called John Furnham, who made two major contributions to the study of British prehistory. One was to point out that the tomb shrines and the round barrows actually belong to different millennia, instead of, as assumed hitherto, being built by the same people. Now, this was a real and valuable and permanent advance in knowledge, but Furnham also added the assertion they were made by different races, and this was unsupported even by his own data. The subsequent addition to his ideas that the tomb shrine people were small and dark and the stone circle people, tall and blonde, was absurd. 
their skeletons are actually of the same size, and you can't tell a person's complexion from their bones. Nonetheless, these Victorian beliefs lasted until the mid-20th century, largely because so many other Victorian structures did empire, great power status, racism, gender polarity, and an economic dependence on heavy industry, reliant on extracted minerals. A further component in the invasion model also endured, the notion of Britain as an island threatened by foreign attack. This repeatedly surfaces in accounts of its prehistory and actually strengthened through the 20th century because of two world wars and then the beginning of the Cold War. The whole traditional vision of Neolithic and Bronze Age British prehistory, which I've been describing and explaining, unraveled during the 1960s and 1970s. In other words, at the time when I was coming out of school and to university and engaged in my own studies, I was there. And by 1980, it was gone, although it still has echoes in popular works of fiction or non-fiction to this day. I was myself, as said, a witness of the whole process of disintegration at close quarters, and so I can speak about both the public and the largely unspoken factors involved in it. So now I dish the dirt. The greatest basic factor was the two decades concerned witnessed the end of Victorian Britain. I was invited by my then Vice-Chancellor at a posh dinner party about seven years ago when it got boring to come up with a party game. It's a nightmare for anybody. And panicking, I asked everybody at the dinner party to come across a year in which Victorian England ended, or Victorian Britain. And the interesting thing was everyone chose different years, but everyone picked one in the 1960s. And you can see why the changes. The end of the empire, great power status, a fear of invasion by land forces, as opposed to missiles, an economic dependence on heavy industry, and an official tolerance of racism and sexism. They all went together out of the window, and a Victorian model of prehistory now became vulnerable. Another factor working for the change was the great expansion of higher education, in the same period, creating many new experts in prehistory. Linked to the general disrespect for traditional ideas, which was also a feature of the years around 1970, trust nobody over 30, man. <laughs> this prompted a wholesale questioning of received models. The mere fact that we'd been taught something as an orthodoxy and we were a year younger with total confidence made it fair game for questioning. And the final major development relevant to our subject was the improvement in dating techniques for ancient sites based on the analysis of radiocarbon, which became available in the early 70s. Combined with improved statistical analyses of data, these have permitted more and more precise dates to be achieved for prehistoric material. In itself, this single scientific innovation rendered the old model untenable. It shattered the presumed chain of transmission for the religion of the great goddess from the Near East to Western Europe. Much of the evidence for the transmission of the great goddess's worship in the Mediterranean basin turned out to be much younger, not older, than that on the Atlantic seaboard. And the dating revolution was even more lethal to the idea of the Beaker people, invasions. All of these innovations that have been associated with those invasions, circular monuments, cremation, metalworking, and the range of specific prestige goods, vessels, tools, weapons, was proved to have, were proved to have arrived slowly at different times in the thousand years between 3200 and 2200 BCE or BC. They weren't part of a single cultural package. They didn't all come together. And advances in genetics, especially in the analysis of DNA, proved there'd been no significant arrival 
of a new racial group in the whole of the period concerned. A much enlarged body of excavated material showed that the earlier Neolithic, the time of the tomb shrines, was actually a lot more warlike than the later Neolithic and Bronze Age, the time of the stone circles. In fact, chillingly, the Long Barrow period, the tomb shrine period, the period of the fourth millennium BCE in Britain, has more evidence of vicious warfare than any other periods of prehistory, including the Iron Age. So the question of whether women or men led prehistoric societies has become pointless because we completely lack any decisive evidence for the nature of social structures in early British prehistory. From the same evidence, the evidence we've got, you can visualise matriarchy, patriarchy, theocracy, autocracy, aristocracy, democracy, or low-level tribal chieftainship as you please. And there's no better evidence, objectively, for the nature of the deities worshipped in the British Neolithic or Bronze Age. You can imagine what you want. The concept of a universal great goddess was abandoned by all British and most European and American archaeologists because there was nothing solid to prove it, but it remains possible. And it must be emphasised that it's pretty well certain that the prehistoric British believed in goddesses, or at least in powerful female spirits, simply because traditional peoples always do. This is, however, a very different thing from believing in one single all-powerful deity associated with the earth alone across the whole ancient European world and the neighbouring parts of Asia and Africa. That looks very much more like a modern construct. Only towards the very end of the ancient pagan world, attested by history, did such monist or monotheistic religious ideas begin to be art be articulated, and they were never embraced by the majority of pagans even then. But let's come clean again. To my own generation of young scholars, the idea of the Neolithic great goddess had three features which made it especially unappealing. None of them having to do with logic, they're all to do with emotion. The first was that it seemed so clearly a post-Christian construct of a single, universal, good, primeval religion, of a single great deity, which later degenerates into the pagan polytheism of the historic ancient world. This model comes too obviously from the Bible, for those of us who've never been Christian to take too easily. The second was that the great goddess idea, as articulated until the 60s, seemed to present such an essentialist concept of femininity. Uh, the way that the older generation of academics fed it to us was of the female as mother, nurturer, representative of fertility and regeneration. There was nothing about the female as a ruler, a scientist, a craftsperson, or a repository of intellectual wisdom. But when you look at the historic pagan goddesses of the ancient world, you find lots that actually are patronesses of these more dynamic and empowering qualities. And the third drawback was that the great goddess embodied a sharply polarised view of masculine and feminine. Anthropology was, by the early 70s, giving us huge quantities of new information about the ways in which gender relations had been constructed in non-European societies. It showed us the great range of possibilities which were actually open to human beings. By 1975, one British anthropologist, Shirley Ardener, could pose the exciting question of whether our Western categories of woman and man might not disappear altogether. Clearly, for those who were bisexual, gay, wanted to be transsexual, this was really exciting and liberating. To those like myself, who are heterosexual, but felt that a, a more tolerant attitude and diverse attitude to sexuality was a healthy thing for our society to acquire, this was also hugely attractive. To many British prehistorians, therefore, it was a relief when the great mother goddess disappeared from the textbooks and a shock 
when she came back to Britain from America in the 1980s, but this time embarrassingly for us who are radicals and socialists as part of radical feminism, uh, a movement against which we had no easy defense. American writers had taken up the old idea of an essential female nature and a great goddess and simply attached a positive value to those aspects of it, which had often been treated as negative. And this movement attracted the support of one distinguished archaeologist, Maria Gimbutas, the leading Western expert in Eastern European prehistory. She reasserted the whole traditional idea of a goddess-centered, Pacific, and creative Neolithic Europe, destroyed by Indo-European warriors worshipping sky gods. She simply gave it a new liberationist message instead of the deeply conservative one with which it had been sold to us when we were young, and so was Maria Gimbutas. In other words, British and American radicals, like me, had dealt with the shortcomings of the old model in different ways. The British lot had deconstructed it. The American lot had appropriated and reshaped it. Both are excellent strategies for dealing with an inconvenient intellectual construction. The problem is they are completely mutually incompatible. As a result, the very British academics, now growing to maturity, who had supported the demolition of the great goddess construct in the name of socialism, feminism, and gay liberation, now found themselves being abused as patriarchs and reactionaries by converts to the new American goddess movement. My concern here, however, is with what those same British academics put in place of the goddess and the patriarchal invaders. What they provided in brief was Marxism, the most dynamic intellectual movement in the years around 1970, in which many of them were educated. In one aspect, this produced a secularization of prehistory, depriving religious belief of any status as a force in itself and grounding all ideology ultimately in economic leads and the power politics they generated. The tomb shrines were therefore now interpreted as territorial markers built by people who were taking on the new Neolithic farming lifestyle. This involved settling down on the land and dividing it up, and the new monuments served to warn strangers that particular plots were already taken. The human bones inside them were interpreted as those of the first people to occupy that farm, who were then revered as ancestors by their successors. This was part of a continuing process of affirmation of group identity and rights of possession. And the transition to the age of the circles was seen as marking a shift from a society based mainly on those group identities to one in which powerful individuals were more prominent. In the tomb shrines, the bones had been mixed together in large monuments, requiring considerable effort. In the round barrows, people were buried individually, and the most important had personal possessions, prestige goods, interred with them. Now, this model certainly seemed to explain why the British in the third and second millennia BCE were apparently so fond of consumer goods, weapons, tools, pottery, and ornaments in increasing numbers and variety. With equal certainty, it suited British society in the 1970s and 1980s, both in its secularism and in its stress on the individual. Above all, the British in the mid-20th century had themselves passed from models of behaviour which had largely been based on collective and conformist models, think of the early episodes of Coronation Street, to a rampant individualism based largely on new and rapidly changing fashion accessories. Okay, we're now in the third millennium BCE. Greed is good. The Marxist system of explanation, however, always left major parts of the evidence unexplained. One was the new interest in the circle, 
as the vital unit of sacred space. Another was why people moving towards the new individualism should still engage in huge collective building works, such as Stonehenge, Avebury, Mace Howe and New Grange, which dwarfed that needed for the tomb shrines. And it founded completely when more was discovered about the early Neolithic way of life, which wasn't based on an agrarian economy of farms and fields, but on a pastoral one of people migrating with flocks and herds along seasonal routes. The clusters of tomb shrines could not therefore have marked out family plots. Furthermore, the bones in them were added at successive intervals and so could not have commemorated founding ancestors. They do seem to indicate a religion mediated at least partly through the dead. The model of British prehistory based on religion and race had developed and flourished for 150 years. The Marxist one fell apart after less than 30 years. In the 21st century, no new big explanations have appeared to take the place of either. Instead, we have a range of individual su suggestions from different experts. One is that the very process of constructing huge monuments, needing as it did project managers, helped to create a new elite class of individuals, hence the prestige goods. Another is that a sense of the sacred, which was traditionally focused on places and hence on monuments, became refocused on humanity and so on prestige goods. A third is that people passed from honouring multiple ancestors to a single ancestor, so the dead are remembered by their possessions rather than by their bones. It must be obvious that none of these explains the change in the form of monuments from tomb shrines to circles around 3000 BCE. A couple of other recent analyses have acknowledged the important point that a shift to single burials with prestige goods under round mounds is not just a British phenomenon. It's found from one end of Europe to the other in the third millennium BCE, the late Neolithic. And it seems to have spread east to west across the continent. And our own University of Bristol, the nearest university to Glastonbury, something which gives me endless delight because I'm at Bristol, a pair of uh, guys, Richard Harrison and Falker Hyde, have credited it to a new ideology. This emphasized material objects as the basis for personal identity and social position and venerated the sun as the focus of religion. And another prominent British archeologist and a very alternative type friendly one, Tim Darville, has also found evidence for enhanced sun worship in the new interest in circles and orientation of monuments on solstices. He has also found solar imagery and designs on stones and pottery at the same time. Some place is therefore now being made again for religious factors in analyses of the changes around 3000 BCE, but only by a small minority among experts. This and the lack of any prevailing theory of explanation for the changes concerned clearly suits our contemporary social world of a dominant secularism, hence the lack of interest in religion, and a celebration of individualism and diversity. I'd suggest that it's both important and necessary now to note what is missing in it. And I, I might say, I'm not just saying this to a, a friendly alternative audience like yourselves, I'm also saying it to my academic colleagues. Race is obviously gone as an explanatory force for perfectly obvious and good reasons, but so have invasion and migration. Instead, the new fashions which spread across prehistoric Europe and took such dramatic forms in Neolithic Britain are credited to individuals who arrived here two and four and a half thousand years ago as salespeople, traders, marital partners, and migrant workers, bringing the relevant fresh ideas and technologies. This is, of course, a perfect projection onto prehistory of the world of the current European Union and the global economic order. It certainly can fit the archaeological 
and genetic evidence, but there is a big problem with it, which hits you as soon as you turn your eyes from prehistory to ancient history. And that is that invasions and mass migrations of ethnic groups are a major theme of recorded ancient history. As soon as Britain emerges into the historical record, parts of it were occupied successively by Romans, Anglo-Saxons, Irish, Vikings and Normans. And the Roman Republic was at times attacked and endangered by warlike peoples from the north. And the Western Roman Empire, of course, was destroyed by more warlike peoples from the north. And further back, the beginning of the first millennium BCE, Phoenicians and Greeks established maritime colonies all across the Mediterranean. And further back in the second millennium BCE, one group of invaders, the Hyksos, brought down the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. And another, the Sea Peoples, fatally weakened the succeeding new empire. In the same period, waves of, pre, of, pre, of predatory invaders destroyed successive states and civilizations in Mesopotamia. Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians all go down against attack from outside. Experts in British prehistory, however, will not admit to one significant military incursion or migration into Britain in the whole of the last four millennia BCE. The DNA evidence may actually not be very helpful here if people on both sides of the North Sea and English Channel already had quite similar genes by the Neolithic. Perhaps everything did change dramatically and hell break out as soon as history began. But if it did, then such a remarkable phenomenon deserves more discussion than it's receiving. After the collapse of Marxist scholarship, ideology is now once more being given more recognition than before as a force in its own right. But there's still reluctance among most British archaeologists to accord this to religious ideology. Even when explanations are admitted in religious terms, they tend to be in the form of heavenly bodies, the sun, rather than in terms of the deities to whom such bodies are commonly related in traditional societies. The study of the British Neolithic and early Bronze Age matters because this period produced some of the most spectacular prehistoric monuments on Earth. They include, between them, in Britain alone, three world heritage sites with more in the pipeline. And the study of them is currently involving more specialist scholars with more students and a more sophisticated range of technological and intellectual aids at their disposal than ever before. It would be both impudent and reckless of me, therefore, to suggest that scholarship in the university system is currently largely neglecting no less than three of the most important areas of human experience when dealing with the Neolithic. They are the sky, which ironically is the bit of the cosmos that's changed least since the Neolithic. Invasions and migrations, movements of peoples, and the worship of goddesses and gods, or at least of some potent spiritual being. This does, however, somehow, seem to be precisely what I've ended up by suggesting. Thank you for having listened to me so calmly and patiently for my time here. <laughs>